I'm afraid my talk isn't going to lead us in the same end space as where we just were because the job I do doesn't make me feel really comfortable about effacing the differences in a simple, in a simple way, although I love the sentiment of it. Crimes like upskirting don't happen in a vacuum, said Stella Cruz, the MP, writing about her attempt to recognize the motivation of misogyny in instances of hate crime at the beginning of this month. They happen in a world where we don't see violence against women as a priority for action. Where we tell young women to not walk around late at night as a way of staying safe, rather than those who hassle them that their behavior is unacceptable. Misogyny is a way of understanding inequalities. This isn't crude identity politics or special pleading. Misogyny is a way of understanding the structural issues that a patriarchal society depends upon. It's a challenge to the blame we visit on the individual women, woman for her circumstances. It's a critique of the way things are. For me as a psychotherapist, it's a way of thinking about our psychologies in the simplest of terms, how we make boys and how we make girls. How the behaviors and feelings, aspirations and capacities associated with gender shape our beings in ways in which we're often unaware. Secondly, and I think this is what the previous speaker was saying, how stepping outside of what we've absorbed in the making of us can make us feel desperately uncomfortable and uneasy making. Now, when there's a social, church, social surge for, for social change, such as Me Too and Time's Up Express, the possibilities for personal change are underpinned by a social movement. This is what happened in the first wave of feminism when women won the vote. With the second wave of feminism, of which I'm part of that generation, women dared to speak up and to listen to ourselves to challenge societal norms and create institutions that were more responsive. At a more complex level, understanding gender in the context of misogyny has been about developing theory that can explain the costs of gender socialization and the risks implied in trying to change it. It can, and this is the uncomfortable bit, and I feel funny sort of talking about this the day after the Kavanaugh hearings, but hey, I wrote this last week and I didn't know it was going to be a direct hit on today. It, it can explain women's participation in relationships and behaviors that are not in their interest. Relationships may involve violence, intrusion, and humiliation. And the stimulation of behaviors on the women's part that look from the outside as self-destructive. And it can describe from the women's side the conflicts that we have about taking up positions of power. It can explain the reluctance to insist on our point of view, our economic and our social needs. It can explain men's fear about women's power. I think you only had to look at the Senate hearings yesterday. Men's own difficulties with the expectations that they've absorbed intricate mesh between men's and women's insecurities and the fraught relationships at work and in personal life. It can explain motivations, what pushes each of us to interpret and act in relation to implicit gender rules. It can provide a framework for understanding both Kavanaugh and the women he allegedly assaulted. Before 1970, women's experience in psychology was told from the man's point of view, whether the theory was written by women or by men. We learned to say no to sex, and popular culture said that meant yes. 
but it didn't. We learned that women were needy, overly dependent, couldn't separate, were clingy and masochistic. Just look at the psychiatrists and the psychotherapists' um, rule books from those days. If women were lucky enough to have orgasms through intercourse, they were mature. Any other way, they were immature. Or if they were anorgasmic, they were frigid. Women's life stages were understood in terms of biology, motherhood, and wifedom. What a feminist consciousness brought to psychotherapy was an insistence that we need to listen and reflect upon what women were bringing to the consulting room and to think about in terms of the conditions of their lives and their socialization. I'll come back to that. Psychotherapy is no kind of soft option. It used to be that people so misunderstood the job that they thought it was like being a hairdresser. Or conversely, that we would interpret dreams in terms of penises and tell people who they really were. Or give them a set of exercises to perform to fix them up. Or a way of letting the individual off the hook through instigating victim culture. Therapy is none of these things. Psychotherapy is a deep practice, a highly skilled practice. It isn't a question of see one, do one, teach one. It's a long apprenticeship, comparable to a specialized medic, and like other skilled practice, it involves lifelong learning and a great deal of reflection. It is at once a relationship which engenders healing, a healing that starts with reliance on the therapist, but in turn develops the tools inside of the individual, the family, the couple, or the group. It's a treatment for trauma, for disordered minds and bodies, for addressing disturbed attachments, and if it doesn't sound too schmaltzy, for addressing broken hearts. When I say broken hearts, I mean it in the widest possible sense. Our hearts get broken when cruelties are persistent, when we thwart ourselves and one another, when the love and caring so central to human existence is rejected, when ego comes to replace contribution, when longings for social justice are shredded in the name of hate or progress, or when we see what's happening to our NHS, not the people inside of it, but the people who are supposed to support it. When ther what therapy exposed and detailed was how women had absorbed in the deepest sense of who we were and who we are, so much so that we weren't even conscious of it. The knowledge that it would be our job to look after, to nurture, to care for, to soothe, to help our children, our mothers, our lovers, our friends, our aunties, our co-workers, to be who they needed to be without expecting that for ourselves. We were there to provide a relationship they could depend upon. We learnt that we needed to tend to men's vulnerability in ways so delicate that they wouldn't know that we were doing so. And meanwhile, they would feel independent and manly, while we might secretly relish seeing this their most tender and vulnerable spot. We became midwives to the aspirations of others. And I think the numbers of, of uh, people in senior positions attest to that still today. In our struggle to understand the individual, we thought about class, ethnicity and racism, disability, about the impact of where one was born and to whom, geographically and so on. We were becoming aware of the exclusions of sexualities, we knew the way the educational health and mental health union and management structures all militated against even a notion of equality and how this affected how we were raised, the models we grew up in and the aspirations of change. But we wanted to understand the mechanisms from day one, from before we were even named a girl, as to how a whole set of behaviours and expectations would affect how we were held, talked to, fed, weaned in ways that were far more profound than whether we played with dollies or aeroplanes. 
In other words, how it happened and then felt inside of us. There was a noble tradition within psychoanalysis in which Franz Fanon, the great psychoanalyst from Martinique, had written the brilliant Black Skins, White Masks in 1952 about the internalization of racism inside of his people. We thought we could bring some of that methodology to our work. Back in those days in the 1970s, it was mothers or grandmas or female mother substitutes who raised girls and boys, and they raised girls and boys differently despite their conscious intent. They raised girls in their own image. They treated them as they treated themselves. In comparison to boys, and every study showed this and continues to show it, they held them less, they breastfed them for shorter periods, they weaned them earlier and more rapidly, they potty trained them earlier, and so on. They didn't do any of this consciously. Mothers would often say, I raised my children the same, but that's entirely inaccurate. Because parents, mothers, female carers, had internalized and then enacted on their own experience. Let alone the fact that the time when you're a first-time parent is very different than when you're a second-time parent. I was to do it myself, as were many of my highly conscious friends. What these obvious and observable behaviors showed were the ways in which girls were being prepared to get and expect less to keep quiet or not even know their own needs while providing emotionally for others. Today we can see a projection of the young girls of needing to make it and be it and do it, turning themselves to a brand in which they have to be oh, ever so on all the time, which is bringing a whole set of other issues which we might have time to talk about. But for many of the women using our services, what we were and are learning in the consulting room and sharing with the wider public and to policymakers is about his histories of violence and of sexual intrusion being deeply misunderstood, of having nowhere to turn, so that what is being revealed is then withdrawn and hidden away as it's so hurtful and shameful. Because mental health services are now dealing with the extreme end of distress, and that's a diminution really of what's, what, what we want to be dealing with, we heard and hear about horrendous levels of violence in childhood, patterns of domestic abuse, or troubled relationship in adult life. And it's possible to see the links between these experiences. And I want to say again, I feel very odd talking about this today, but so be it. When early childhood attachment is shown to include emotional and physical violation, and those, many of the people that end up in our mental health services, then the notion of love, of connection, of caring becomes gnarled. We may seek to avoid what is diminished or impinged upon us, we may enter adolescent or adult relationships craving and giving understanding and warmth and gentleness. But we may find that we're not so ready to receive relationships which are more wholesome. We may not know quite how they fit. Love, for me, is not as simple as the meditation exercise. Relationships of love don't or wholesome relationships don't necessarily provide the highs and lows of rupture and repair that characterize relationships of violence or abuse and manipulation. They're lovely, but they may not have the ring of emotional recognition. They may not slot into what we understand as relationship. This deceptively simple and yet emotionally excruciatingly difficult idea that what we've experienced inclines us to what we want, fall into, or crave, is one of the thorniest issues for us when dealing with women in need of protection and of protecting themselves. 
How can we talk about women's participation in unhealthy and unhelpful relationships among ourselves without getting defensive, without blaming the victim? And yes, I believe to help one another, we must at certain points come to own our own participation in relationships that hurt. Our own desire to think we can solve the problems that the other has and make them all better. That we can reach the violent or abusive woman or man and repair them and fix the relationship. That's part of what motivates us. It comes out of being psychologically structured to care and it's something we really have to watch out for. And not unrelated, we have to watch out for the equally troublesome problem of recognizing women's inner frustrations that might inadvertently lead to provocations and goading to get attention. But that this desire for attention may in turn solicit abusive relating from a partner. In saying this, I want to go beyond our own prejudices, beyond the territory of doer and done to. Yes, the women we work with are both victims and survivors of abuse. Yes, the context is internalized patriarchy on the part of the women and on the part of the men. Yes, the social ground in which hurt is perpetrated, the sexist, classist, racist, transphobic, ageist culture is the primary progenitor. And yet, at the level of the individual, there is individual responsibility. We all provide an abundance of understanding and compassion. And that is a genuine feature of our work and why we're drawn to it. And we also make a demand on the women we work with to risk looking inside of themselves. Not to blame, not to excuse, but to see the ways in which unintentionally we can participate in aspects of dysfunctional and hurtful relationships. Please don't misunderstand me. Threat, intimidation, whether from an acid attack, to the removal of one's children, to physical and emotional abuse, are never to be underestimated. What I'm saying does not negate the many forms of violence perpetrated against women whether by Trump, who thinks copping a feel is his right, or the much more extreme experiences of violence. What I'm drawing attention to is why women might stay too long and how they might become resilient enough to leave and grow. And this brings me back to what makes change possible. One of the unique, poss one of the unique capabilities of a women's service is the resource to help women help each other. This is a key feature of transformation. As we break isolation, link hearts and words and minds together, we change what is and what can be. Learning to live with new possibilities, learning to hear one's own needs, one's own voice, one's own vulnerabilities and fears, happens when we're not isolated, when we have an ear for each other. This is, too for the, this is true for the professionals who have to bear considerable amounts of pain. Learning together enlivens us and in turn serves our patients well. As therapy services became more available to women, and therapy in general entered the cultural conversation, there have been significant developments in innovations in treatment, as you would expect. In time, of course, the impact of trauma and its capacity to deconstruct a human being has become a whole new area for psychotherapy. That word is now commonplace, perhaps sometimes applied too widely. But its revival and application, re women in abuse and violence, is very important. Likewise, attachment theory, updated in a way so women are seen more fully. As, all, as and as well, that has become mainstream, as has relational practice within psychotherapy and psychoanalysis. Now, curiously, these three ways of thinking have taken centre stage within psychology, within psychoanalysis, without much, without any acknowledgement of the feminist and gender conscious input which has made the psychology of the mother and the mother's struggles for her own subjectivity central to the understanding of the early mother-child relationship, or indeed the nature of the relationship in therapy itself. Like so many advances, Feminist practices, theories and ideas finally get absorbed without being recognized. 
the creation of and existence of Oxley's excellent women's center by Maggie Shadell, of the Women's Therapy Center, of Women's Aid and other organizations by feminism are coming to be accepted just as of right. Whether it is that abuse is ubiquitous or discrimination wrong or that zero hours low wage contracts are desperately difficult for those on them, the feminist input is subsumed under a social justice agenda. And to some extent, that's fair enough. The Senate hearings on Kavanaugh should be about ensuring social justice. We meet a woman giving voice to her own aggressed upon experience before she knew that there were other women who were gonna come forward to accuse Kavanaugh. And yet, we see the denial, the baying, the turning of the tables, so that it's she who seemed to be on trial. She's not just doubted, she's attacked. Her testimony is perceived as aggression. It's tragic and enraging and reminds me why we need spaces that can provide for women's experience to be listened to. Being heard engenders mental health. It's a prerequisite. Before women were listened to, children weren't listened to. We know how important it's been to listen to children. Closing down thought, silencing, ridiculing, robs us all of our humanity, our dignity, and our truths. In the midst of this horror, we need to stand together with people in struggle, with those who are hurt and in difficulty, whose understandings and actions try to make human relationships inside and out equitable and nourishing. The NHS is not simply a sickness service. It's a public health provider, the best of who we are. The NHS absorbs and witnesses society's secrets, society's damage, and our resilience. What we learn in the consulting room is what needs to inform and shape our practice, to feed back into discourse about notions of health and provisions of dignity. We know the talking cure, or as I like to think of it, the listening cure, is effective. Its long-term outcomes hold up well against CBT, and yet the commitment to such a service is not what it should be. It's woeful. As is the psychoeducation of medics, which diminishes them and their capacities to treat their patients as well as they wish. Professor Christine Blasey Ford talked yesterday in the Senate about how therapy had helped, and we need to heed that. We don't want abuse to continue. We don't want to be hurting like hell and with fury inside of us as we try to push forward agendas that can respect us all and allow us to thrive. We urgently want women's services to continue and be supported. We collectively know a great deal about women and what goes wrong, and what helps to make things go right. We must keep speaking and learning and challenging, and do so together with our enmity focused on the outside, while we build bridges, solidarity, and understanding between us. Thank you.